Hi, this is Matthew Cratter from Trader University. And today I want to talk about Warren Buffett as an investor. Has he lost his touch or is he still a good investor? If you're interested in Warren Buffett or just want to learn trading strategies and investment techniques that work in the current market, be sure to hit that subscribe button. So the first, I would start by saying that Buffett is very interesting in that he has the best public marketing of anyone that I know. He's basically a hedge fund manager. When you think hedge fund manager, you think very brash people uh, throwing away their money, basically smoking cigars with their money. Someone like Bill Ackman, for example, uh, manipulating stocks and being a fairly arrogant guy. Buffett is the exact opposite. He's very down home. He lives in Omaha. He reminds everyone of their grandfather. And you can imagine him sitting on his porch in Omaha, sipping cherry Coke and looking out, uh, looking out over the world. In fact, what he runs is essentially a hedge fund. It has a different legal structure. Berkshire Hathaway is structured as a holding company. It's not structured using the same structure as a hedge fund, but it's basically a hedge fund with very, very good marketing. He does use derivatives. He's got a whole insurance operation. And he, in addition, he holds operating companies as well as holding stocks and derivatives. So that's the first thing, uh, the first thing to note. I always find that uh, when someone's new to investing, they have a very high opinion of Buffett. And then uh, you can tell someone who's been in the business for a while because they have a much lower opinion of him as I do. The more you read about him, the more you learn about his life, uh, I find the less likable he is. Lots of really weird stuff. There's, here's just one example of uh, Buffett's first wife introducing him to his second wife. You can read more about this stuff in the, uh, the Snowball, which is really the, the definitive authorized biography, biography of him. Uh, so my take on Buffett in this video is going to be that he's, he's very much akin to someone like Muhammad Ali or Michael Jordan, who should have retired and uh, stayed retired. Ali is famous for retiring in 1979 and then coming back, I think just a year later and getting knocked out by Larry Holmes, coming back because he needed the money. Now, obviously Buffett doesn't need the money, but I think he really has overstayed his time. And uh, this is a fairly controversial opinion, but I hope to be able to back it up with some hard facts in this video. So what I have here is I'm going to look at Buffett's performance versus the S&P 500. On this side, we have uh, Buffett's uh, Berkshire Hathaway stock, the Class A shares. Over here, we have the SPY, which is the, uh, the ETF for the S&P 500. Looking at performance from uh, the end of April 2010 to the end of April 2020, just a couple days ago. And I didn't plan it this way, but it turns out that over the last decade, Berkshire Hathaway and the S&P have returned roughly the same. Uh, now, the SPY actually pays a dividend. And over this period, it was really anywhere from, call it one and a half to uh, maybe 1% to 2.5%. And so taking dividends into account, the S&P 500, if you just bought the index, has outperformed Berkshire Hathaway for the last uh, 10 years. Berkshire Hathaway obviously does not pay uh, a dividend. They retain their dividends and reinvest them. So this is what one thing we would expect. Uh, a lot of this has to do with the, the law of large numbers where Buffett is running this really giant operation and it becomes much more difficult to have incremental performance when you're managing a lot of money uh, versus a very little bit, uh, a smaller a smaller amount of money. Now, many people after watching this video, you're going to ask me, have you performed more in Buffett over these various time periods? I absolutely have. Obviously, uh, nowhere near his net worth, and it makes it much easier to have high performance numbers when you're a smaller investor. But basically, would have been no better off investing in Berkshire Hathaway than the S&P 500 over the last 10 years. And I think after Berkshire falling today, after the sort of disastrous uh, annual report over the weekend, I think the S&P is, uh, is, uh, is well ahead. So that is sort of the 10-year performance for Berkshire Hathaway. Uh, the five-year performance uh, from April 2015 to April 2020, Berkshire Hathaway up 32% and S&P 500 up 39%, not counting dividends. So Buffett underperforming over these fairly long time periods, uh, five-year and 10-year periods. We can see here that this is an updated to the present, but uh, what alpha is a measurement of, it's basically a measurement of outperformance over the benchmark or over the index. And so we can see that back in the 70s and 80s, Buffett was outperforming, and this is looking at kind of a rolling five-year average, but Buffett was outperforming the S&P 500 by 
by 20 percentage points, 30 percentage points, 50 percentage points. And over time, as Berkshire has grown, Buffett's outperformance has obviously uh, uh, gone, gone down. And there have been years where he's actually rolling periods where he's actually underperformed, as we saw in the last slide. Uh, he's sort of in line right now. I haven't updated the five year rolling averages, but I imagine they would look um, they would look worse. They'd be very, very close to zero, if not negative. So what this shows is that Buffett's performance over time has approached the index. He hasn't been outperforming it. And again, a lot of this has to do with the law, law of large numbers. But as I'll argue in this video as well, it's also that he is just not as good of an investor as he used to be, or the other way of saying it is the investment environment really since 2000, uh, the environment where uh, so much of the stock market performance is dependent on central bank manipulation, money printing, this sort of thing, that bu it's not really Buffett's environment. Uh, the other thing I would say is that in the modern world, in the age of the internet, there's a lot more competition and brands do not hold their value as long as they used to. And so Coke, for example, was like a hundred year brand. And now it's really been losing a lot of market share and revenues have been stagnant for years simply because there's a huge amount of innovation going on. You can get CBD beverages, you can get very interesting herbal beverages, and there's no reason to uh, drink the same thing that you were drinking in the 1970s. Uh, but Buffett really, he has not moved on and has not embraced technology uh, very famously. So what, what contributed to Buffett's great performance over these many years? Obviously, he's a genius. He's a very, very smart guy. So I don't want to take that away from him. And I can certainly say that when I'm 89, I hope I'm as uh, cogent and, uh, uh, and intelligent as he, as he sounds. Uh, but one thing I would suggest is that a lot of his performance just came from being able to buy stocks when they had really, really low PEs, as they did in the mid-70s, for example. And this is where he really set up a lot of his, his uh, outperformance. In 1974, he's famous for telling Forbes, and I'm going to sort of change the language here so I don't get in trouble with YouTube, but I'd say like I feel like a, uh, a guy in love in a place, uh, in a harem. I guess we can use that word. He used a word that begins with a W that you can see here. And uh, there's a reason he felt this way, and he was using obviously this, this uh, sort of funny metaphor. Um, but the reason he felt this way is PEs were very, very low after the bear market of 74 and 75. We can see that in January of 1974, you had a PE of 11.68 uh, for the S&P 500, dropped to down to close to eight. Now a PE of 10, if you have a PE of 10, if we invert that and think of it as sort of a yield or earnings yield, it's a 10% 10%, uh, 10 earnings yield. And so when you're able to invest in stocks that have very low PEs, your performance is going to be much, much better over long periods of time, especially when the whole stock market is priced this way. And Buffett, over his whole career, really benefited from the fiat system, the fiat money system. Uh, money printing and interest rates really falling for the last 30 years. This was the tailwind uh, that helped propel him. Again, not to take away from his intelligence or anything. He's obviously a really brilliant guy. Now let's talk about his airlines investment. Uh, he was famous for saying a few years ago that uh, he was joking that he had a 1-800 number that he would call if he got the urge to buy an airline stock, uh, kind of analogous to um, someone calling uh, if they're an alcoholic, having a 1-800 number to call for support. Uh, he's very famous for saying that airlines are a bad investment, and yet he went against his better judgment bought the airlines. Uh, here's another famous quote from him. How do you become a millionaire, make a billion dollars, and then buy an airline? But in spite of all this, he did buy um, the four big US airlines in 2015, 2016. These have been a disastrous investment, and he finally dumped them in April, going against his uh, better judgment. And I'm sort of going to elaborate here on these various bad investments that he's made that have really contributed to his underperformance. Uh, here's another tailwind, really. You can see when he started investing, when Berkshire was really getting, obviously it started much earlier in the 60s, uh, but uh, federal debt, total public debt as a percentage of GDP was much lower, around 40% in the uh, late 60s, early 70s, we're now above 100%. The whole system has been levered up, interest rates have come down, and the financial system is in a very, very precarious 
position. And I would argue this is the world that we've inherited from people like Warren Buffett. They did very well, but they're not passing on uh, a really sustainable uh, a sustainable world. I'll link to his uh, his video from over the weekend. Uh, it's very long. It's like four or five hours, but it's, it's definitely worth watching. Now I'm going to go through a series of bad investment decisions that Buffett has made uh, over the past decade that has contributed to his underperformance. Obviously, IBM is a big one. IBM has meant, used to be the technology company in the U.S. I think Buffett bought this in, uh, I want to say 2010, 2011 or something like that. He finally got out of it in, uh, in 2017 and, uh, and the following year. Uh, but it just shows how out of touch with tech uh, he was, Invest, investing in something like IBM. Um, he's invested in, obviously, all the big banks. Wells Fargo has had um, really a lot of bad publicity for, justifiably, over the last few years for cheating customers, uh, laundering drug money, and uh, opening up uh, lots of account managers, opening up lots of frivolous accounts just to generate commissions, etc. Buffett has always stood behind the CEO, but this is really the kind of thing he invests in. These uh, these big companies, uh, here's a great meme, I don't always go to the bank, but when I do, I avoid Wells Fargo. So he's an investor in Wells Fargo, uh, Bank of America, here's a Wells Fargo CEO getting his hand caught in the cookie jar. Uh, Goldman Sachs is another big investment that he made during the uh, during the financial crisis of 2008 to 2009. I've always, I've always loved this analogy of Goldman Sachs is a great vampire squid wrapped around the face of humanity, relentlessly jamming its blood funnel into anything that smells like money. I think this is a really good analogy for how Goldman Sachs has worked. But this is the world that Buffett, that Buffett moves in. Uh, he was an investor in Solomon Brothers. He, um, he, he moves in circles of power. His father was a, a senator, in fact, and a lot of people, a lot of people don't know that. Um, also investor in Bank of America, another uh, really, I think, a, just a really bad company. Bad customer service, bad technology, outdated website, uh, just just bad everything. Now, in addition to investing in these companies that really benefit from regulatory capture, Buffett has always been a, a big champion of bailouts. And especially in 2008 and 2009, he really pushed for, uh, pushed for TARP. And if you just go through his, I'll link to this article, but if you go through his holdings, he was holding all these banks, including uh, Goldman Sachs, and his companies uh, really benefited from uh, the bailout of the banking system, which has turned out to be a disastrous thing. It has just left uh, the system more precarious than ever because of the quantitative easing that's needed to be done since then. And so each crisis that, that comes is bigger and bigger than the, than the last one. Regulatory capture, I should just define it. Uh, basically, this is where regulatory agencies, for example, the agencies that regulate the U.S. banks, they become dominated by lobbyists or inside actors who move back and forth between the regulatory bottles, bodies and the banks. And they basically craft laws in such a way not to protect the consumer or make things better for the consumer, but rather to stifle co competition, to make it more difficult for new fintech companies, etc. And I would argue that this is Buffett's main way of investing. He likes investing in monopolies, duopolies, oligopolies, companies that benefit from regulatory capture that stifle innovation. And I think this is a very sinister, a sinister way of doing things. And it's also it's also hurt him over the last few years. He's tried to invest in. Um, well, I should, I'll come back to uh, I'll come back to this slide. But he's tried to invest in uh, in companies that have strong brands, that have strong network effects. And this was sort of the Buffett playbook from many years ago, buying American Express, uh, buying uh, Coca-Cola, for example. He tried to do the same move with Kraft Heinz, ended up overpaying, and Kraft Heinz is sort of a declining brand. Uh, these are the products that I used to eat in the 70s, and most of them are like really bad for you. There's no reason to, to eat them now. And so they've been losing market share for years and years and years. That's one reason Kraft and Heinz, two separate companies, had to come, come together. And Buffett was one of the big people who helped finance this uh, back in 2015. He said that he overpaid. He admitted that he had overpaid uh, for this merger um, as an investor in this merger from, I think, a year a year before that, but he had no plans to flee the struggling packaged foods company. If we look at uh, Kraft Heinz performance since then, this is where that quote was from. 
it's just gone straight down and it's obviously uh, a declining business. Uh, Buffett has admitted that he was wrong about tech. He's very famous in 99 and 2000 for saying that uh, there's a tech bubble, which he, he was right about. But the problem is, even though he's friends with Bill Gates, he doesn't understand the underlying tech. As a result, he didn't invest in Amazon and Apple till they're already uh, worth hundreds and hundreds of billions of dollars. And this makes sense. There are these generational differences. You don't expect your grandfather to, um, to be up to date on tech. But I think when we're listening to Buffett, we, re we really have to take everything he says, especially related to technology with a grain of salt. And if he hadn't, uh, he was very smart to invest in Apple and Amazon. I think the main reason he did it is he could see that these are monopoly businesses that uh, are completely unregulated. There's no antitrust action against them. And that's what he likes investing in companies that have a lot of pricing power because they stifle competition. It's, it's sort of ironic, it's the opposite of, of uh, capitalism. Also, I must say I'm not a fan of his, his investments in food companies. The reason he does it is because these companies sell very addictive products like Coke. And there's a famous lecture that Charlie Munger gave, I think at Harvard, where he talks about how clever it is that Coke puts salt in their soda, and so you get even more thirsty and you wanna drink a lot of it. Obviously, there's been a lot of research showing the ties between uh, heart disease and diabetes and, uh, and sugar. Coke is one of those really, you know, I don't think it's something that adds a whole lot of value to the world. I used to drink it. I don't, I don't drink it anymore. Uh, but I would say that as a, um, you, you, you definitely want to stay away from all of his, all of his food companies, uh, Seize Candy, Coke, Dairy Queen. These are, these are companies that are not good for humanity. They contribute to obesity uh, and they do, not, they do not make the world a better place, but they do offer addictive products uh, that Buffett likes to, likes to profit from. Kraft Heinz is another great example. Um, I'm sort of partial to Planters Peanuts, I have to say, maybe Grey Poupon, but most of this stuff, it's not really food. Uh, it's not food as our grandparents would have understand, understood food. And it contributes to the health crisis. And what happens in the obesity crisis, what happens is the profits from these companies are privatized. The shareholders get them. Though in Buffett's case, they haven't done a much good in, in terms of Kraft Heinz. And then the societal effects, the obesity, the, the, uh, the huge medical expenses, those are all socialized. And we all pay for those in our health insurance uh, premiums. So I think that's really the sinister thing about these kind of companies. And I'm glad to see that there's much more innovation in the food and beverage space uh, these days, uh, innovating and producing uh, healthier products. And I have to say Kraft Heinz is always, they're always following, they're trying to uh, you know, follow up and come up with something gluten-free when it's already become a trend, et cetera. But they're, they're not doing a very good job of it. And millennials and Zoomers have just no interest in these brands. These were big brands when I was a kid in the 70s uh, but 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 no longer. The other thing I would say is Buffett's really benefited from the lack of antitrust regulation against his company. If you think about what Berkshire Hathaway owns, they own trains, they own utilities, they own giant chunks of, of Apple and Amazon, they own uh, insurance companies, housing companies, uh, clothing companies, furniture companies, uh, and it just goes it goes on and on and on and on. Uh, and it just, it's, it's a testament to Buffett's lobby, lobbying prowess and his marketing ability that a company like this would not be broken up as a conglomerate that's just too big and that, uh, that stifles innovation, that keeps prices unnaturally high. You can't have a single company controlled by a single person in all these groups and not, not break it up. But this is, um, this is how money talks and uh, Buffett has the best public image of anyone. And so you have this just monstrosity that controls huge amounts of, the, of not just the US economy, but the global economy. And yet he gets a, gets a free pass. Even Microsoft got attacked by the antitrust folks. Uh, but it's amazing that, that Buffett has been able to duck it. Um, so instead of investing in ketchup, instead of investing in Coca-Cola, instead of investing in companies that do regulatory capture, like insurance companies and banks. Imagine if this man had devoted his genius to thinking about things like outer space, thinking about things like uh, technologies to extend lifespans, to cure diseases, 
rather than to cause diseases uh, like things like Coke does. So in many ways, I've been, I've been harsh on Elon Musk, but Elon Musk is much more my sort of investor. Obviously, Buffett comes from a different age, uh, an age where there was much less innovation in the economy. The economy was much more homogeneous. Uh, and so he has a certain shareholder base they would go crazy if he started investing in uh, SpaceX or rocket companies or, or something like this. Uh, but I would just contrast this with Buffett's style of investing. His style of investing is to invest in companies that participate in regulatory capture, that stifle innovation, that are monopolies like Apple or Amazon. And um, so it's not, uh, he, do, he gets to profit from the results, but these are not things that are good for humanity as a whole. So imagine if he had instead put his money toward outer space, toward biotech. And I think his Berkshire Holdings going to the Gates Foundation, maybe some of this will be done. I'm not totally sure how the Gates Foundation, what their future investments are going to be. Uh, but outer space, biotech, these are the kind of things that excite me. Uh, different forms of energy, maybe finding a way to bring back nuclear energy in a safer, safer way. These would be things that would definitely help humanity over the long term rather than trying to come up with addictive beverages like Coke, like Charlie Munger uh, likes. And uh, I would say another thing that Munger and Buffett, they just, they show themselves eating all this garbage food uh, and then, you know, living into their 80s and 90s. Not good role models. They have very good genes, obviously. They're both very gifted individuals. And, uh, but it's not, not exactly how I would like my kids or grandkids uh, to be eating. And I think it's misleading uh, to always show yourself eating a hamburger and drinking Coke and expect and pretending that that uh, uh, that, that that's good for your uh, that's good for your health. Lastly, uh, we're going to talk about Buffett's vision of gold. Buffett has badmouthed gold uh, really for years and years and years. The most famous example comes from 1998, uh, where he's he's a delightful storyteller. You have to give him credit. Uh, he he tells this little parable: gold gets dug out of the ground in Africa or someplace, then we melt it down. Uh, obviously make it into gold bars, uh, dig another hole, bury it again, and pay people stand to stand around guarding it. It has no utility. Anyone watching for Mars would be scratching their head. Buffett, I am convinced, understands fiat money. He's a benefit of the fiat, the paper money system, the U.S. dollar not being backed by gold anymore, not being backed by anything. He understands this. The guy is an absolute genius. He's much, much smarter than me. And so I would say that rather than being stupid in this area, he's actually evil. And he's always pushing down uh, bad-mouthing gold, uh, whereas we all know that gold is a store of value, whereas the US, the U.S. currency, the U.S. dollar, loses its value over time. So I thought I'd go back and just look at how gold performed since Buffett delivered uh, this cute anecdote at Harvard in 1998. When he did that, gold was uh, approximately 288 dollars an ounce. This was uh, sort of an average for the year 1998. You can see it's, it was sort of tr uh, stuck between 287 and 290. So roughly in this range in 1988, 1998. I didn't look up the exact date. Today it's currently trading at uh, 1721 an ounce. It is up 496 percent since Buffett gave the speech. What is Berkshire Hathaway up? At the same time he gave the speech, Berkshire Hathaway was roughly seventy thousand dollars a share. For the A shares, it's gone up 279%. And so the man who says that investing is gold and stupid has been unable to keep up with gold's performance. And so I'll, I'll end on this because it's a very good example of why you can't trust Buffett for very many things, especially when they have to do with new technology or uh, sort of his blind spots to the fiat system. He's never going to badmouth the Fed or the banks or these things that have helped him make money. And so when, when Buffett talks about Bitcoin and calls it rat poison squared, I would urge everyone to take it with a big grain of salt. Um, I've actually done a video on Buffett and, and Bitcoin, which I'll link to below, and you can read out more on this. Uh, but a lot of people come to me and say, why do you like Bitcoin so much? Buffett doesn't like it. I hope I've, uh, this lecture has helped you to, uh, this video has helped you to understand a little bit more of where Buffett's coming from. He's coming from the point of the fiat money system, regulatory capture, stifling innovation, uh, forcing paper money on everyone. And this is obviously, he's made a lot of money from the US banks and the US banking system as a result of this. Uh, if you found this video helpful, if you like my teaching style, you can check out my courses, uh, my online courses. If you wanna learn about uh, trading strategies that actually work 
rather than value investing, which is completely dead. Buffett's uh, method of investing does not work in the modern world. It worked in the 70s and 80s and maybe the 90s. But with the increasing pace of technology, you have to update your investment techniques and your trading techniques. So if you want to go a little deeper, I'd encourage you to check out my courses, especially if you're still in quarantine, you've got a lot of free time on your hands, and you're tired of binging on Netflix. So I have a course on options, investing, uh, bear market trading strategies, my flagship course, learn to trade stocks like a pro, as well as a course on financial statement analysis made it easy. Um, Buffett has always said that financial statement analysis, uh, the language of accounting is really the language of business. I think he's right on this. We can obviously learn a lot from the way he thinks about companies. We just have to sort of update the thinking. That's partially what I do in this course as well as uh, some of my other courses, Learn to Trade Futures. I have a course on investing in real estate, uh, covered calls, uh, really just hours and hours of material here if you're interested. If you are, uh, click on the link in the description notes below and it'll take you to uh, this page. You can scroll down right here and click Get It Now. And that'll take you to the checkout page. Normally access to all the courses, all 13 courses. It's just $125 tuition for 30 days access. But I wanna give you guys a coupon code because we're currently uh, in a recession. YT, as in YouTube, 99. And then click that update button. That'll take $26 off. So just be $99 for 30 days access. There are no long-term contracts or anything like that. So you can watch all the courses, take notes, cancel before it renews and you won't be charged again. And if while you're watching them, you have any questions, I'm available uh, by email to answer your questions. And so this really will be a good uh, interactive learning source. And if there's anything missing, if there's a course or lecture you'd like to see added, I will uh, record it just for you, post it for everyone to see on the uh, at Trader University Premium. And in this way, I hope to really make this one of the best investing and trading sites on the internet. Please hit that subscribe and like button if you haven't done so already and you found this useful. And let me know your questions and comments in the comment section below. Hope you're all staying well, and I'll see you in the next video.